you know, as we're going through, we will. Otherwise, we'll leave them for the end, and we'll um, and answer all questions at the end. Um, so, um, as an overview, just to you know, give everyone an idea of what we're doing today, um, before we you know jump into the content, I just want to let everyone know that we will be covering. You know, there will be an LCFS background um, for folks who are newer to creating an LCAP or advocating for an LCAP. We will look at school climate LCAPs across the state, um, a review of those, of foster youth, um, foster youth at LCAP across the county of Los Angeles. Um, and then we'll talk about best practices with um, including um, investments and, and goals for, for students um, regarding school climate and foster youth. Um, and then we'll open for questions. Before we do all of that, I do want to, because I know there are a lot of different kinds of people, um, a lot of different kinds of stakeholders um, here with us today, so I wanted to, um, you know, launch a poll and, um, and find out, and the poll is open now, and so if you would, on your screen, if you would take it, um, I want to know you know, the type of um, stakeholders that we have with us today. Um, this webinar is, of course, for everyone. Um, and we just want to make sure that we know, you know, we're talking about creating LCAPs and advocating for LCAPs or, um, you, know, you know, what that can look like. So I will leave this poll open. And I see quite a few of you right now who are taking the, um, taking the poll are advocates, um, educators, and I have a couple of um, parents here, too. And you can select more than one if you are more than one of those things, of course. And so we'll let um, keep that open for about 10 more seconds. And again, if you're having any problems with taking the poll or hearing me or any of that, um, please do let me know in the chat. All right, it looks like most of you have, um, seems like most of you have answered. So it looks like we have about 15% of you who are parents, guardians, or community members. 31% of you are educators. We have a large number of advocates here today, so about 70%. And then um, we have 15% other. And if you are a person who clicked other, would you mind putting in the chat box, um, you know, who, what other means? <laughs> um, and that would be, that would be great. So we can, you know, think about how to, um, you know, target our comments. So let's um, jump right into content. Um, I would like to, um, so sorry, hold on, I jumped ahead. Um, so, of course, as you know, this is, um, you know, a fixed school discipline webinar, and so I just wanted to note that for all of the things that we'll talk about today, there is guidance in our fixed school discipline toolkits um, about, you know, meeting the LCFF, um, so local control funding formula and LCAP requirements. Um, there are tools and samples for implementing school climate strategies, and then also firsthand experiences from different educators and community members across the state of California. You can download them at fixschooldiscipline.org, or you can email me at info at fixschooldiscipline.org for hard copies, and I will mail them to you. Um, so as we get started, I wanted to talk about, you know, I know people are at, you know, different levels of, um, familiarity with the local control funding formula. And so just so that we're all on the same page, basics, um, the local control funding formula increases base funding for all students, and then it gives supplemental funding for students who are low-income English learners or foster youth. And then for schools um, and districts with concentrations, large populations of those students, it gives an extra grant called concentration funding. There are eight focus areas around um, that have been prioritized by the state to improve and increase education um, for uh, those low-income English learners and foster youth. Um, those, um, uh, those areas um, have to do with student achievement and engagement and, um, and the conditions of learning. Um, we 
at fixschooldiscipline.org focus a lot on school climate. Um, but this, you know, what I'm explaining now about what you're supposed to do to meet the school climate requirements, you can, um, you know, duplicate that for also the other eight focus areas. So you need to determine baseline data and have that included in your local control accountability plan. Um, which um, sets out the local control funding formula regulations. You should also establish goals for improving school climate or any of those other um, focus areas using metrics um, that you know speak to what those priorities are. So for school climate, that's suspensions, expulsions, um, student surveys, and and other related metrics. Then you want to adopt specific actions and services to meet those goals and identify the expenditures that will pay for those specific actions and services to meet those goals. And then this local control accountability plan, which is developed to um, direct what you do with the local control funding formula funds, um, is um, developed and adopted by July 1st. Um, and is linked to the district's budget or the LEA. And I've noticed that somebody said that they do a lot of work with charter schools, and charter schools um, for this purpose of funding are LEAs, so lo uh, local education agencies, and so it would be um, very similar. So it would also be linked to that budget. Um, so um, let's talk about school climate across the state and the LCAP. So I'll use the acronym LCAP a lot, meaning Local Control Accountability Plan, and I'll say LCFF for Local Control Funding Formula. And I know it's an alphabet soup, but it helps us get in a lot of information in a limited amount of time. So um, I really want to thank Brian Lee at Fight Crime Invest in Kids, um, who couldn't be here today, actually, because he's advocating at the State Board of Education in Sacramento to shape the LCFF rubrics. Um, but he did an extensive, exhaustive report um, reviewing the LCAPs for 50 of California's largest school districts. Um, and he has made a few different, um, you know, there are a few key findings, and I want to outline those here. Um, so the first finding is that all districts now have suspension reduction goals in their LCAPs, which is really great. However, you know, only a few more than last year identified actual specific and measurable goals. Um, and so if you look at this graph, um, you'll see there's, you know, general goals, ambiguous goals, and then obviously specific ones. Um, when we're talking about general goals, that kind of means, you know, the district in their LCAP or the LEA, um, local education agency in their LCAP said, will reduce suspension rates, but didn't give any numbers. So what are we re reducing them to, or what are we reducing them from, was not clear. Or for instance, um, you know, ambiguous ones. Um, say something like, reduce rate by 5%, and every, you know, the LCAP looks at three years, and every um, year said, we'll reduce the rate by 5%. However, um, it's not clear, is that 5% total, or is it 5% in each year? Um, so that would actually be 15% and not 5%. Um, and, um, you know, there, there has been an improvement um, in, the, uh, in, in the number of districts um, actually in, including specific goals um, and ones that are not ambiguous, and so that's now 62%. Um, and which is, you know, improvement over last year's 54%. Um, the second finding was that um, most districts, many districts, did not disaggregate their goals by subgroup. Um, so, so the subgroups specifically that are required, of course, are the are foster youth, English language learners, and um, low-income students. Um, but the those weren't dis those weren't disaggregated, and neither were other you know subgroups. So only thirty six percent of dis
strategy and how much is going towards, for instance, you know, a different cafeteria program. Um, next, it is clear that districts are doing a better job of identifying goals related to the school climate survey. So those are um, are required using a school climate survey to measure school climate. Um, is required in the LCAP, um, and 80% of districts actually included um, goals on safety and connectedness, which is a significant increase from last year, but only 36% of them included, in, included goals related to safety and connectedness. So um, if you can look at the, the, um, the pie chart over here, you see how many are safety and connectedness, or safety only, or connectedness only, um, or just generally school climate, um, just noting school climate, and then you see that about 20% have, um, you know, just not, um, not um, identified anything related to surveys, but 22% have survey-related goals for students, parents, and teachers, um, all three, um, which is required. Um, and then finally, finding six, um, you know, many districts, did not include current year data to measure their progress. Um, and since LCAP are supposed to be annual updates, um, you know, the information about last year's, so year one suspension data is really key. Um, and of course we, you know, identify and, and Brian Lee and identified also in his review that um, it is challenging um, because LCAP are drafted before the year is over. However, some districts did, you know, report suspensions through May, or they compared their first year suspensions um, from, you know, one year to the previous year. And it's also challenging, you know, if to look at your progress if you don't list, you know, specific funding for your um, your or specific goals that have specific expenditures attached. Um, so you can't really make any changes or figure out, you know, what what improvements you need to make if you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> so it goes to that old adage, if you, um, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. My mom, my mom used to say that. Um, so um, those are the findings from the Fight Crime Invest in, in Kids um, report and review. Um, and so we will definitely discuss best um, practices and recommendations um, related to these findings, so what districts should do, what LEAs should do, what um, advocates should advocate for. Um, but now I will turn it over to Martha Matthews, who is um, the very, very knowledgeable um, directing attorney of the Children's Rights Project here at Public Council um, and an expert on issues related to um, foster youth, among you know many other things, of course. Um, so Martha? Hello. Um, so I'm Martha Matthews. I'm the director of the Children's Rights Project at Public Council, it's, as Sarah just said. And um, Sarah, let me know if there's anything anything wrong with the sound. Um, so we did a, a narrower survey. Um, we focused on school districts within Los Angeles County and specifically what their LCAPs were doing for the smallest of the three what are called unduplicated student populations, and that is foster youth. Um, so I wanted to start by saying, you know, why, why did we do that? Um, foster youth are a very small population. They're typically 1 to 2 percent of any district's student population. But they're 1 to 2 percent at any given point in time. And this is a really interesting thing about the data because, unfortunately, one of the reasons foster youth struggle in school is that they change schools three to four times as often as anyone else. Um, and what that means is that if you do a point in time count of how many foster youth are in a, a school district at any given day, you might get 100. But school districts are discovering, as they get deeper into the data, that over the course of the year, they might have three or 400 foster youth moving through their district on an annual basis. So you know the, the data you see at a point in time count is a tip of the iceberg. And although it's a small population, it's a very vulnerable population. And the reasons you can see on the first slide, the frequent school changes, obviously anyone who's 
been to school can remember what it was like to be the new kid. Imagine being a new kid four or five times in the course of your K-12 education. Also, foster youth tend to have gaps in attendance because every time they change placement, it takes a while for someone to enroll them in school. And those gaps in attendance tend to add up. Um, likewise, by definition, if you're a foster youth, you've suffered from abuse, neglect, or abandonment, and so you haven't necessarily had a consistent adult supporting your education. Um, and then finally, and I'm sure I don't need to talk too much about this to this audience, the impact of trauma on learning. Foster youth um, typically have a high ACEs score for those who know what that is, that you know the level of trauma they've experienced in their life, and that impacts their learning. So for, for those reasons, foster youth tend to have lower educational outcomes in terms of graduation rates, GPAs, college attendance, pretty much anything you want to measure than any other subgroup, lower than low-income students, lower than English language learners, lower even than students with disabilities. So they're a small population, but a highly vulnerable population. And their educational needs are not just like anyone else's. They're not just, oh, they're just like low-income students. They're not, actually, because they move schools more often. They have these gaps in attendance. They have issues that other students don't have. So that's, that's why to focus on this population. Um, and also in the context of school climate, um, foster youth are particularly important for school climate. Because remember, they're always the new kid. They're always the kid who has to enter a new school. Are they going to be welcomed, or are they going to push, be pushed out? If someone is mean to them and they respond by fighting, are they going to get suspended their first day of attendance? Um, so the intersection between foster youth issues and school climate issues is highly important. OK, next slide, please. So I wanted to explain a little bit about our methods, because unlike Brian Lee, none of us are social scientists, and we don't even play social scientists on TV. Basically, we are a coalition called the Coalition for Educational Equity for Foster Youth here in Los Angeles. And what we did is that we read the LCAPs, uh, and then we tried to code them on an Excel spreadsheet. And so this is a fairly informal qualitative study. We looked at the 30 school districts with the largest populations of foster youth in Los Angeles County. And that includes LA Unified, which dwarfs all the others. LA Unified has approximately 8,000 foster youth, which is 10 times as many as any other district in the state of California. So we had one really huge district, and then we looked at about 28 others who had foster youth populations of over 100 students, between 100 and 600. Um, so that's, you know, that's the, the, the N, the survey size. Uh, and then I also wanted to caution sound a note of caution about the limitations of our results. As anyone knows who's tried to use the LCAP template, it's a little difficult to use. And various districts used it in different ways. And so it was difficult sometimes to connect the goals in the LCAP, the actions the district intended to take to fulfill those goals, and the funding attached to the actions. Um, so our results should be viewed with caution. Uh, but we were trying, in a qualitative way, to figure out how various districts address the needs of foster youth in the, this is the second year of the seven-year implementation process of the LCFF. Um, so obviously, I said LA Unified is by far the largest. So I wanted to just start with, with a, a little results on, on LA Unified. Next slide, please. Next slide. case management uh, support, campus level support to foster youth. And also, they committed to doing actions on the district level in terms of policy, uh, creating MOUs with the County Child Welfare Agency, and doing a much better job of gathering data on students who are foster youth. So uh, LA Unified's 
LCAP is by far the most detailed and articulated in terms of what um, what that district is going to do to address the educational needs of foster youth. And it's somewhat proportionate to the number of foster youth that are students in LA Unified. But of course, LA Unified is unique statewide. There is no other district that's anywhere near that large. So it's also important to look at somewhat smaller districts that are more comparable to districts elsewhere in the state. Next slide, please. So we also looked at, and the, the, the numbers in parentheses on this slide are the numbers of foster youth who were students in these districts identified in 2009 data. And we used it because it was the best quality data we had. So those numbers, again, probably haven't changed that much, but they are not current data. They were just the best data we had when we wrote the report. Um, so you can see on the slide that various districts came up with some promising practices in terms of what they were going to do uh, for foster youth in their LCAPs. Um, they were maybe going to increase the number and amount of FDEs devoted to their foster care liaisons. They, some of them are going to track data. Um, some of them are going to provide more school social workers. Some of them are going to focus on prompt enrollment, reducing those gaps in enrollment. Um, so you, you get the idea. And then you can see that the third column in the slide, we also looked at whether there was incremental change between year one and year two. You know, were the districts, we were hoping that more districts would make a commitment to foster youth in, second, in the second and subsequent years of the LCAP process. And in fact, we found that to be true, that there were an increased number of districts um, that were starting to put in specific provisions for foster youth compared to year one, which is the result we were hoping for. Because in year one, obviously, you know, the districts were just barely beginning the LCFF process, and it uh, is understandable if they didn't do much for this, this fairly small population. Um, but we're hoping, especially with visibility and advocacy, we would see better results in year two. And, and that did, in fact, happen. But things aren't perfect yet. Next slide. So these are the things that we were still a little bit worried about, uh, even in the districts that were, were really making efforts to address the needs of foster youth. First of all, as I said in the very beginning, the thing that is unique about foster youth, the, the educational challenge that they have that other student populations don't have, is frequent school transfers. And so those of us in the coalition believe that if you want to improve educational outcomes for foster youth, you have to address school stability. And we were somewhat disappointed that very few districts' LCAPs really focused on that issue specifically. Uh, foster youth, as many of you know, have a right to remain in their school of origin even if their placement changes. But in order to implement their right, uh, district enrollment staff need to know about it and raise the issue and not just sort of default like, oh, the kid moves, let's, let's enroll him in a new school, but actually inquire, where did you come from? Do you want to stay where you came from? How far is it? What transportation might be available? Um, so we, what we hope will happen in future years is that more districts will realize that you have to start with school stability if you're going to genuinely improve outcomes for foster youth because people can't learn if they're moving from school to school to school. Secondly, we were a little worried at the emphasis on social and emotional supports. The tendency often is to say, oh, they're foster youth. Let's get them a social worker. Well, foster youth already have social workers. They, most of them already have some level of counseling, some level of case management. Um, and not that school-based case management isn't helpful. It can be very helpful. It's that you don't want to forget that they're students. And they also need very concrete forms of academic support. For example, making sure that they're in the right classes when they enroll in a new school retrieving records and counting credits from all the schools they've attended before and figuring out what classes they need to graduate, uh, providing access to tutoring, after school enrichment, and summer enrichment programs. So again, in future years, we hope that districts will really enhance the level of academic support that they're providing to foster youth. And then the not so good news. Um, the districts that weren't on the chart that I showed just a moment ago, um, there were some districts with very large foster youth populations that didn't do much at all. Um, and there were 
districts, some districts with, with large populations that had nothing in their LCAPs about foster youth. So that was disappointing. Um, and again, we hope that some combination of advocacy and peer pressure will change that as the LCFF implementation process gets further along. Next slide, please. Um, but again, remember I wanted to sound a note of caution about our findings. Um, it was difficult to interpret some of the LCAPs. We had some districts with very large populations of foster youth who didn't seem to be doing much in their LCAPs for foster youth, but they, those, some of those districts pursued what I might call a hyper-local approach, where they really tried to empower each school principal um, in terms of discretion over funding. And so it was, again, it was difficult. They, they didn't do a lot of district-wide initiatives, and so it was difficult to figure out what they were doing for foster youth. They may, in fact, be doing more than we could see from just reading their LCAPs. Likewise, because foster youth are a small population, some districts uh, combined some of their actions, their funding, and their staffing for foster youth with other at-risk populations. Like they would have a staff person who was both the foster youth liaison and the homeless youth liaison. Or they would offer um, enhanced access to tutoring for foster youth and English learners. Um, so that actually may be an effective approach, but again, if you're just reading the LCAP and you have things lumped together, it's very difficult to figure out the funding and the staffing allocation that is specific to foster youth. Um, and then finally, one thing that we came across uh, in our research that we didn't, you know, we weren't, we weren't looking for it, but we found it anyway, is that we saw some districts using surprisingly large amounts of money for things like school police, um, metal detectors, drug detection dogs, um, you know, things that seemed somewhat problematic, especially in terms of the use of supplemental and concentration grants that are supposed to specifically benefit these at-risk populations. Um, you know, again, if you're a foster youth, you want your school climate to be as welcoming and positive as possible. And there's, there's lots of research, which is detailed in the Fixed School Discipline website, that these kinds of measures, more police, more, more security guards, more metal detectors, um, are not productive of a positive school climate. So we were, we, that was sort of a, an ancillary finding. It's something that we just noticed as we were reading the LCAPs, and we were a little worried about it. Uh, next slide, please. So I also just wanted to link our foster youth findings back up to the school climate issues. Um, there were some of the district LCAPs that we reviewed had what we called leveraging opportunities. They had things in their LCAPs that weren't specifically targeted at foster youth that we believe will especially support foster youth. For example, those districts who really focused on taking a positive approach to attendance issues, instead of just sort of saying, your, trudent, your truant will refer you to the SARB and you know, punish you for being trudent, truant, really noticing who has chronic absenteeism, how can we support them, how can we intervene to bring them back into school. Foster youth, especially in the high school grades, tend to have high rates of chronic absenteeism, and it, that, so those those LCAP provisions, even if they're not specific to foster youth, could be especially beneficial to foster youth. Likewise, the kind of positive school climate investments that Sarah mentioned, again, not specific to foster youth, but especially beneficial to a population that, again, tends to always be the new kid, tends to maybe be the kid who gets They tend to be behind in credits, again, because they've moved school so many times. Um, and so investments in things like after school and summer enrichment, credit recovery, anything that sort of assists people in catching up will help foster youth. Unless, however, I want to just sound a note of caution, sending people to alternative and continuation schools 
can be a form of push out. And so those programs really need to be used to enhance and supplement attendance at a comprehensive school rather than, oh, you know, don't enroll here, you're behind in credits, go down the street to a continuation school. Um, so that bullet really should mention that those things are supplements to inclusion in a comprehensive school rather than al in an alternative. Um, OK, next slide. So here are some examples of the things I was talking about. These are things that are not specific to foster youth, but these are some LA districts with larger populations of foster youth that had some interesting and creative programs that may be especially beneficial to foster youth. Um, and you can, you know, there's more detail about this in our report, and so I, I won't go into detail on it now. Next slide, please. Um, so what, what should happen next? Well, as Sarah mentioned, every year uh, in July, every district in California has to make a new version of their LCAP. And the LCAP drafting committees in every district are working now. Um, and the process is very, very strongly driven by stakeholder involvement, or at least it's supposed to be. Um, but one of the things we found a little disturbing is that every district is supposed to be have what's called an AB 490 liaison, a foster youth liaison. Those people often were not only not consulted in the LCAP drafting process, but sometimes didn't even know what was in their own district's LCAP. So it's crucial for people who actually work with students who are foster youth to find out what's in the district LCAP and how it could be better. Um, and there's, there's lots of resources to help do that. Um, next slide, please. Uh, sorry, right. next slide. Oh, 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 I see. Oh. OK, go ahead, yeah. Sarah. Sorry. Um, so yeah, no, but thank you so much, Martha, for that um, information. Um, and we will re revisit what, um, for in this section, we will revisit um, you know, the school climate recommendations and also um, foster youth recommendations um, for the LCAPs. Um, so these um, recommendations are gleaned from the sixschooldiscipline.org toolkits, um, from also the site Crime Investing Kids report and from advocates and educators across the state. Um, so, you know, there are kind of these four big recommendation buckets, and underneath them, you know, there are all sorts of different things. But um, you want to, you know, kind of as a best practice, include the current year's data on suspension rates and um, school climate metrics. Um, and for those, you want to make sure you're, you're making specific and measurable goals. Um, you want to also include in-school and out-of-school suspensions, suspensions for willful defiance, especially as we know that those suspensions for willful defiance um, have um, a much more disproportionate impact on um, students of color, but then also students who um, have extra needs, like our low-income English learners and our um, foster youth. And then you also want to look at citations and arrests. Um, if um, you know your your school district or your school, um, you know if you're in a you know charter LEA um, has um, you know law enforcement on um, campus um, or campuses, um, you also want to disaggregate suspension rate goals by subgroup, um, and uh, you know this is really important for the foster youth, low income, and um, and English learners. However, you you may also have other subgroups um, in your district or in your schools that um, face disparate um, impact when it comes to suspension. So you want to look at that data. So you're looking at the, the current year's data. You want to disaggregate it by all of the different subgroups that you have um, you know, and see well, are we suspending more students of color? Are we suspending more of our foster youth? Are we spending more of our low-income youth. And then we want to make different accelerated goals for those, those um, youth in order to close the gaps, right, um, and, and eliminate the, the disparities. You want to also include support for evidence-based alternatives to suspension, also called school climate strategies. Make very clear funding for those strategies and the related personnel. So, you know, funding for um, training, for professional development, for coaching. Um, maybe you need to also hire coaches. Maybe you need to hire co um, coordinators. Um, 
you know, how you, you want to put in, you know, exactly the full-time, you know, personnel that you're putting in um, and detail how the funding will be spent. Will it be spent on training or will it be a different bucket spent on coaching? Um, and then finally, um, you definitely want to include the school climate survey related goals because um, that is how we find out, you know, are these things working? So students, um, teachers, and parents, we want to know, do teachers um, feel like, you know, the school climate at the is supportive? Do students feel supported? Do parents feel included? All of those um, items. I also wanted to include um, and show you what these practices could look like um, in an LCAP to give you guidance as you, um, you know, develop your own LCAP or as you advocate for, um, you advocate for different, um, uh, you know, policies and practices and action services to be included in your school climate LCAP. Um, and this um, LCAP is available, the school climate LCAP um, draft kind of um, model is available at sixschooldiscipline.org. So here you can see that I, we included, um, you know, in the goals section, and again, we, we've uh, collapsed it all in one. So this is a goal, <laughs> this is a very uh, heavy goal, um, and often I know that to make it easier to follow um, and, and make it easier to, um, you know, make it clearer about what is happening. Uh, district often separate these, separate goals out and separate different needs out and, you know, apply them in different ways. But um, this is what it would look like if it was all in one place. Um, so in the goals section, you can see um, reducing percentages of exclusionary discipline and also increasing the number of students feeling safe and connected to school using the student survey. Um, if you look in the identified need area, these are some of the ones, and, and we explained which ones are recommended and which ones are required. Um, we think there are best practices, so those are the ones that are recommended as, in a, as being there um, and being included in addition to um, uh, the required one. So office discipline referrals, if you collect that information, if you know where that information is, um, it's a good way of seeing, you know, how many students are, you know, losing learning time and being pushed out of the classroom. Suspensions, expulsions are required. Um, you know, behavior-related transfers um, to, you know, as Martha was saying, to different schools in the district, you want to look into those. Referrals to and citations um, and arrests um, issued by police you would like to look at those. Um, then, you know, um, or, and you would want to evaluate those. If you're, you know, an advocate, you're evaluating it. If you are a, um, if you're a, a district, um, a district, you know, administrator or a person at an LEA, you will want to evaluate this, but also it is our recommendation that supplemental and concentration funds not be used for police, right? Um, because they're going to, you know, as Martha noted, their supplemental and concentration funds are for improving the education of um, foster youth, low-income youth, and um, English learners, and, and police don't, don't, um, don't increase those education that way. Um, so um, you also want to look at using other means of correction. Um, which is recommended, um, increasing the percentage of students feeling safe and connected to school, um, you know, as required. And then if you look at what the goal applies to, the, the lower part of this, you see, you know, all schools, top, suspending, expelling, or transferring schools, you know, you can decide based on what your district looks like or what your LEA looks like. Um,
facilitators um, and you know what you know what kind of training um, and professional development will be provided um, and so now I'll turn it back over to Martha to talk about how to build um, a model um, LCAP for foster youth. So we also, and we'll get at the resource slide at the end, there is also a, a model LCAP for foster youth on the LCAP template that can be imported into your own district's LCAP. But I thought it would be more helpful to use this sort of blueprint tool. And we'll also show you the website where you can download this tool. Um, because we know that districts don't want to just grab some model LCAP language and plunk it into their own LCAP without really stopping and thinking, what are the demographics of our own district? And so we developed this process to sort of customize the model LCAP for foster youth. Um, but before I go through that, I do want to say to everyone on the phone that the first step, if you're interested in improving um, the ways that uh, that the LCFF process is going to benefit foster youth is to read the LCAPs for your own, either the district that you are specifically working with or the districts in your county. And this sounds like a daunting task. Um, I was doing a workshop last year in San Diego, and I thought, you know, I'm just going to read them all. I'm just going to see what all of the school districts in San Diego County are doing for foster youth in their LCAPs. It took me one day. I mean, it was a day of my life, but it was one day. It wasn't 10 days. Um, so I just really want to encourage people, just read them. Uh, the, the LCAP template, which Sarah showed you, had those little check boxes about specific student populations, which makes it easy to scroll through the LCAP and see which things the district has checked are specific to foster youth. Um, so it's, it's not that hard to see what there is now. And then that gives you a powerful advocacy tool, because you'll probably notice that some districts in your county are doing more than others. Uh, just as here in Los Angeles, we have some districts that are early leaders and some districts that are late adopters. Um, and we can sort of use a little, a little peer pressure, a little emerging best practices to, to encourage them. Um, so please, please do that if you haven't already. Um, so this is how this tool works. Obviously, the first step is thinking about your stakeholders and partners. And the unique thing about foster youth as an education population is that there are other government entities that are responsible for foster youth. There's your county child welfare agency and your county probation agency. And there's also your juvenile courts. And there are the attorneys who work in the juvenile courts. And there are advocates called CASAs who are lay advocates who work with the foster youth. So they're, they're actually other potential allies who are very interested in ensuring that the districts do their part to address the educational needs of foster youth. And those people can be mobilized, as we did in Los Angeles through our Coalition for Educational Equity. Um, those people can be mobilized. Our uh, DCFS, our County Child Welfare Agency, is a very active member of our coalition and goes with us to meetings with school board officials and says, we, the County of Los Angeles Department of Children and Family Services, really want to improve the educational outcomes for our students and reduce school mobility. But we can do our part, and we need you to do your part, which is a very powerful message. So engaging stakeholders that are specific to this population is super helpful. And you'll see more detailed suggestions there. And then the next step, obviously, is look at specific data. Um, and there are data quality challenges. There is now state data from CalPADS on identifying students as foster youth. It's not perfect. Uh, it would, it's a good idea to supplement it by a local MOU between the County Child Welfare Agency and the districts or, and or County Office of Education um, because you want to you want to accurately identify foster youth. And then you want to look at patterns in the data. You may find that your foster youth students cluster at certain grade levels. You may find that they cluster at certain schools. That gives you a place to start. Um, and then you may find you may find interesting data about placement types. But LAUSD found that half of their students who are foster youth are actually living with their parents, either because they are living at home under court supervision or because they have been returned home and the court is keeping the case open to make sure everything's okay. So 
the LA Unified Foster Youth Counselors had to figure out how to work with parents to, you know, to, to enhance their children's education. And, and these parents obviously were very nervous about having their students identified as foster youth. So again, you really need to look at specific data for your district or county to see the patterns and see the needs. And that gives you an idea of where to start in your LCAP. Next slide, please. Um, and then, uh, as Sarah was saying, there is starting to emerge uh, disaggregated data for the specific populations on the required metrics. Uh, because foster youth are a small population, the data isn't of great quality yet in most districts, but it's starting to emerge. The draft of the year three LCAP for LA Unified actually has data on academic outcomes for foster youth. It's somewhat frightening data. It shows those youth lagging behind all the other student populations. That data is a little discouraging, but it's also motivating in terms of, OK, so this is proof that this student group needs specific supports. So the more you can do to get districts to disaggregate data for foster youth, the more you'll be able to make the case that these students need specific intervention and supports. And likewise, there are some uh, metrics that are not required by the state that we really uh, think are extremely important to foster youth. And um, they correlate to the reasons that foster youth have educational challenges. Uh, data about school, school transfers, attendance rates, chronic absenteeism, um, those, and then data about the types of schools that foster youth are enrolled in. Those data, we think, especially in districts with a large population of foster youth, will give very powerful clues to what, what the challenges are and how they might be addressed. And then once you've analyzed your data, uh, then obviously you want to look. Look at your year one LCAP. Look at your year two LCAP. Compare what you've seen in the data about your population and its needs to the provisions in the LCAP that exist already and ask yourself, is this, is this enough? Is this really going to work? Next slide, please. Um, and then, you know, if it's not enough, uh, then, you know, then you have a very powerful case for, you know what, in year three, year four, we need to do more. We need to do more to really target the educational needs of this population. Um, and then, of course, once you have enhanced goals and actions, you also want to make sure that your funding corresponds to your goals and actions. So that uh, blueprint gives a roadmap, essentially, to advocacy to improve the ways that district LCAPs address the educational needs of foster youth. Um, and we'll, the next slide, which is our resource slide, shows where to download the resource I've just displayed and also a sample LCAP on the actual template for foster youth. Um, and and the, the review that I was talking about, the narrative report, is posted on the California Foster Youth Education Task Force. Uh, and now I will turn it back over to Sarah. All right, great. And so, you know, this kind of brings us to the end of, you know, all of our information about um, LCAPs and LCFS for school climate and foster youth. And so I um, want to um, I want to open it up for questions now. Um, and you can use the chat function here and I will also um, you know, read out the questions. I, I got a couple of questions about you know, if, if um, folks would be receiving the PowerPoint or if it's being recorded. And so I do want to let all of you know that um, it is um, being recorded and we will, after this, send out um, the PowerPoint. Um, so
it's about you know when you're looking at these things you would do if you're a charter you would do very similarly to what a district would do unless of course a charter there's a difference between a charter school and a charter organizing you know operating um, district so you know depending on how it is done you know there are different um, pieces but I you know emphasize a lot um, the data um, looking at the data across your LEA um, and figuring out what specific things you want to do to get at that data. So, you know, having a broad goal around school climate and then drilling down to what are your specific areas of need, especially for students who are experiencing poorer education outcomes. But of course, I want to, you know, um, open that up to Martha as well to answer. Um, the, um, for foster youth, I think one of the main issues is access to charters. There are currently very, very few foster youth enrolled in charter schools and also other special programs like magnet schools. So to be honest, advocates working on the impl LCSS implementation process for foster youth haven't really focused on charter schools because the very preliminary step is to promote, you know, that, that for example, caregivers with whom a foster youth has lived long enough to be able to get into the charter enrollment process that they think of charter schools as a, as a possible alternative for foster youth. So we're still at kind of the, the baby step, step stage of thinking about how charters can be a resource for foster youth. Great. Um, and then um, there was a question about um, and I'm scrolling back through to all of the different questions that have been asked. Um, and there was a, a, a question asked specifically about um, whether you would recommend, um, um, you know, when you develop the LCAP, if you have a significant subgroup um, of students, um, you know, for instance, you know, uh, 30 students or more, um, or 15 students or more who are foster and homeless, um, you know, are you required to address each significant subgroup or just address them if they have poor educational outcomes? Do you have any feedback from your review on that? Well, the, the, the way the LCSS legislation is worded, and, uh, you know, again, we, we don't know everything yet because the state accountability rubrics have not yet been issued, but I do believe that uh, the school districts are charged with addressing the, um, addressing the educational needs of the three identified populations, low-income students, English learners, and foster youth, and it doesn't depend on whether you already know that educational outcomes for those groups is problematic. And, and that, that's important for foster youth because it's a relatively small population. The data isn't great. You don't know what you don't know. Um, I think very few school districts are actually able to analyze the education data for foster youth right now. And so it would be a catch-22 to say, you don't have to do anything to improve the outcomes unless you know they're bad. Whereas, in fact, you would need to take steps to get better data quality so you would know what the outcomes were. Uh, so the way the law is worded, the, the, the districts do need to address the needs of those groups, whether or not they already have data suggesting that those groups have problematic outcomes. Right. Um. Great, thank you. Um, so I am, you know, um, waiting for any other questions. Those were all of the questions that we received um, about um, that we haven't already answered. Um, I did want to, you know, as people are, you know, feel free to ask any question, <laughs> um, and we will, you know, answer it if we can. I did want to note that you know you can download the site crime investing kids report you can download anything off of the fixschooldiscipline.org site and if you can't find anything please feel free to email me um, also there are many many um, resources on the california foster youth education task force um, site and um, earlier martha noted the invisible achievement gap where um, you could find many um, a lot of information um, on data regarding um, foster youth 
um, and their education outcomes. And then also, you know, if you have any questions later and you can't, you know, maybe it might take a whole email to figure it out or, you know, something longer, you can um, feel very free to email me, um, Martha, or Brian Lee um, to ask any of those um, additional questions. Um, and so I'm, um, and also again, you know, to ask questions, use the chat box. Um, and, um, and we'll stay on a little bit longer um, to answer any of these questions. Um, there is a question about whether funding of the LCAP can be allocated to SROs, and I believe that stands for school resource officers. Um, who are law enforcement officers. Um, uh, I will reiterate that we recommend that that, that shouldn't happen because the, for, for supplemental and concentration funds, those are to be used for um, students, for low-income foster youth and English language learners to increase um, and improve their educational um, the educational opportunities and things um, provided to them. And there isn't any evidence that school um, police officers improve or increase the educational outcomes for these students. So we instead recommend that funding is used for um, research-based strategies like um, the ones that um, Martha and I outlined um, over this, um, this uh, um, webinar and, of course, many others, um, right? So, um, you know, we're talking about restorative practices and positive behavior intervention and support, which actually um, per focus more on prevention and intervention and making sure that issues don't happen, as opposed to punitive functions of, um, of police officers and, um, and SROs. So, you know, there are other funds, right, that are not specifically targeted in this way that you could use if you need to um, use them, but, um, but I, we would recommend that no, those, those are not, that the LCAP funds um, or the su supplemental concentration funds um, not be used in that way. Um, Martha, do you have anything to add to that piece or? Well, once again, uh, the state accountability uh, rubrics have not been completed yet. Um, so I can't say what they're going to say, but what some of us hope they will say is that uh, districts will need in some way to justify the use of supplemental and concentration funds by showing how whatever they decide to do with those funds will specifically benefit the unduplicated student populations. So if, for example, you want to put a new roof on all of your school buildings, that's a great thing to do, but you might want to do it with your base funding because there's no evidence to suggest that a new roof on the school has some specific benefit for the, the vulnerable student populations. Um, so I think the same would be true for school resource officers. If that's something a district believes that it needs, it can use its LCFF base funding uh, for that purpose. Um, but you wouldn't, I, I think, the way I hope the accountability rubrics come out, um, you, if you put in your, L, in your LCAP that you're going to use your supplemental and concentration funds for a purpose which all the evidence suggests does not benefit your at-risk student populations, what I hope would happen is that your county office of education that's supposed to approve your LCAP would come back to you and
out um, during this webinar. And I also want to really um, uh, thank Martha for um, joining me on this and all of her really, really great information. I learned um, a lot also. I'm sure everyone else did, but um, as someone who's been looking at this, um, it's also exciting to learn a whole bunch <laughs> um, um, while you're on a webinar. So thank you so much, Martha. Um, and I think with that, we will and go ahead. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Sure. So I just wanted, well, I wanted to thank you, Sarah. And I also just wanted to put one last plug in for the Fix School Discipline uh, Toolkit. Um, I hope that everyone on the webinar, if you don't do anything else, will at least go and explore that resource because it really has something for everyone in terms of um, district administrators, community advocates, students, parents, teachers. Um, everyone can benefit from looking at that, and it's an it's an amazing and highly accessible resource. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, and so with that, we will go ahead and close, and everyone have a great day. Um, and if you have any questions, again, please feel free to email. Thank you.